Hi everyone, this lesson is on an introduction to sirtuins, important enzymes that may be the key to longevity. So we're going to talk about a broad overview of the different sirtuins in humans, and we'll discuss some of the effects these sirtuins have and some other ways we may activate these sirtuins to have potentially a longer and healthier life. So sirtuins are a group of deacetylase enzymes that regulate critical cell signaling pathways. So they are deacetylase enzymes, meaning that they remove acetyl groups. So acetyl groups look like this. They're a chemical group that is attached to different types of proteins. We'll discuss some of those proteins later on. And sirtuin activation seems to be associated with changes in metabolism, inflammation, and oxidative stress. And some of these sirtuins, as we will see, are histone deacetylases, which are involved in gene transcription. We'll discuss which sirtuins are histone deacetylases later. So there is a sirtuin protein family. There's sirt 1 to 7 in mammals. So in humans, there's 7 of them. All are NAD plus dependent. This is going to be important when we talk about some supplements that we could take to activate these sirtuins. And research into these sirtuins demonstrates that activation of these sirtuins has important implications in health, metabolism, and longevity, especially in conditions like obesity, type 2 diabetes, and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And we're going to discuss each of the sirtuins, and we're going to discuss key targets of each of the sirtuins because there are so many targets for each of them that it would be too much for an introductory lesson, but we're going to discuss some key targets for each of them. And the one that has been most studied in humans is SIRT1. So SIRT1 is going to be the one we're going to put a lot of effort on here. So SIRT1 is going to be a sirtuin that is mostly located in the nucleus of the cell. It can come out into the cytosol to have effects, but most of the time it's going to be in the nucleus. And what does it do? So some of the important things that it does is that it deacetylates histones. So histones are proteins that act to condense DNA. And by deacetylating or removing that acetyl group from histones, the histones become more positively charged. And that's important because the DNA is negatively charged. So by deacetylating histones, we make the histones more attracted to DNA, and that allows them to bind more tighter to DNA and, and cause more condensing of the DNA, and that reduces gene transcription. So when histones are acetylated, the genes are turned on. When the histones are deacetylated, the genes are turned off. You can think of it like that. Another important target of SIRT1 is nuclear factor kappa B or NF kappa B. So SIRT1 inhibits nuclear factor kappa B by deacetylating it. And this reduces the transcription or transcriptional activity of NF kappa B. And this is going to lead to reductions in certain genes that NF kappa B transcribes. And a lot of those genes are involved in inflammation. So by reducing the transcriptional activity of NF kappa B, this can lead to anti-inflammatory effects. Another very important target of SIRT1 is PGC1-alpha. PGC1-alpha is important because it can promote and increase mitochondrial biogenesis. So mitochondria are powerhouses of the cell. They're involved in energy metabolism. And this is especially important as we get older. Sometimes we get dysfunctional mitochondria. So being able to build new mitochondria can be helpful for energy metabolism purposes. And SIRT1 also has effects on activating FOXO1 and 3, and these are important in both lipid and glucose metabolism, and also in autophagy. Now, autophagy is going to be very important. This helps clean up a lot of cellular debris. There's a certain type of macroautophagy known as mitophagy. So mitophagy is autophagy of mitochondria. So by activating FOXO1 and FOXO3, we can increase mitophagy or autophagy of mitochondria to eat up some of the old mitochondria. And because SIRT1 is also activating PGC1-alpha and making new mitochondria, we're going to get mitochondria that are healthier in general in our cells. So we get rid of some of the old ones by mitophagy, and then we get some new ones in our cells. Both of these effects are going to lead to improved metabolic flexibility. And both FOXO1 and FOXO3 have different effects on mitophagy pathways. FOXO3, for instance, increases LC3 transcription. And SIRT1 also inhibits mTOR complex 1 or mTOR, and mTOR is involved in protein synthesis, and mTOR also inhibits autophagy as well. So by reducing gene transcription, by reducing protein synthesis, but also by some of these other effects, SIRT1 can have important health consequences. And some of the findings with regards to how important SIRT1 is 
for longevity especially, is that in CERT1 knockout mice, the CERT1 knockout mice do not demonstrate increased longevity with caloric restricted diets. So caloric restricted diets have been shown to increase longevity in mice, but in the case where the caloric restricted diet is performed in a CERT1 knockout mice, we do not see those same increased longevity effects. So CERT1 seems to be critical in caloric restricted diet induced longevity. And CERT1 transgenic mice, or mice that have had CERT1 added to them, demonstrate reduced cancer risk and reduced risk of metabolic diseases, but not necessarily increased longevity. So there does seem to be an important role for CERT1, but there's still some effects that need to be teased out. Now moving on to CERT2. So CERT2 can also be in the nucleus in the cytoplasm, but more in the cytoplasm than CERT1. It is also a histone deacetylase, so it acts on histones to deacetylate them. CERT2 also has important functions in mitosis. So it's been found that when there is DNA damage, for instance, CERT2 will halt cell division. So that's going to be important to guard the cell against problems with replication. And CERT2 also has important roles in controlling the cell cycle. CERT2 also can activate PEPCK, and this is involved in gluconeogenesis or increasing gluconeogenesis. It's also involved in activating FOXO1. We just talked about FOXO1. FOXO1 is involved in both lipid metabolism and also autophagy as well. So CERT2 can have some similar effects to CERT1, but not as extensive as CERT1. Now moving on to CERT3. CERT3 is going to be located in the mitochondria. It's going to have important effects on energy metabolism. So it can activate long-chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, or LCAD, and it activates LCAD during prolonged fasting to lead to a breakdown of fatty acids. Some studies have shown that in mice that have had deletion of CERT3, they have impaired fat breakdown. CERT3 also can activate HMG-CoA synthase 2, and HMG-CoA synthase 2 is involved in ketone body synthesis, especially synthesis of beta-hydroxybutyrate, and ketone bodies are form during fasting or caloric restriction. CERT3 has also been found to activate superoxide dismutase 2. So superoxide dismutase 2 has important effects in reducing oxidative stress in cells. And CERT3 also has important effects on the TCA cycle. So for instance, it seems to be involved in caloric restriction induced activation of isocitrate dehydrogenase and also in the activation of glutamate dehydrogenase. And again, these effects by CERT2 and 3 have to do with deacetylation of these particular proteins. So those are the three main CERT2 ones, or the three that have been studied the most, but we also have CERT2 and 4, 5, 6, and 7. So CERT4 and 5, like CERT3, are located in the mitochondria. With regards to CERT4, it also can activate glutamate dehydrogenase, but it can also activate pyruvate dehydrogenase, so these are important in energy metabolism. CERT5 has been shown to activate Carbamol phosphate synthetase 1, which is involved in the urea cycle. So it's a very important enzyme in the urea cycle. And also has been shown to activate GAPDH, so it's important in glycolysis. And CERT6 is found in the nucleus, and it also acts as a histone deacetylase, and also has some functions in genomic stability. And then CERT7 is located in the nucleolus, so that's inside the nucleus. It also acts as a histone deacetylase, and it has some functions to act on RNA polymerase 1. So those are an overview of the seven sirtuins and some of their functions. So now let's talk about some ways to activate sirtuins, especially sirtuin 1. So we first have to talk about some of the cofactors that sirtuins require, and we have to first talk about nicotinamide mononucleotide, or NMN. So we talk about NMN because it is a precursor to NAD+. We talked about the fact that sirtuins are NAD plus dependent enzymes. So they require NAD plus for functioning. So we need to have enough NAD plus for these certain enzymes to function properly. And it has also been found that over time, as individuals get older, their NAD plus levels decrease. So supplementing or having enough NAD plus is going to be very important for continuing functional activation of the sirtuins. So because NMN is a precursor to NAD+, if we increase our NMN levels, we can increase our NAD plus levels. So where can we get NMN from? So some of the sources include edamame, avocados, broccoli, and cauliflower. Edamame has the highest 
concentration here. We can also see some higher concentrations in some of the cruciferous vegetables as well. So that's going to be important. Some individuals will supplement with NMN, especially as they get older, it becomes more important, but this is some of the dietary sources for NMN. Now, that's one piece of the puzzle. The second is going to be resveratrol. Now, resveratrol is a plant polyphenol. It is also an antioxidant, and it comes from certain dietary sources as well, including peanuts, berries, grapes, and red wine. So a lot of the health effects of red wine are often attributed to resveratrol. And what does resveratrol do? It not only activates AMPK, AMPK is an important signaling pathway in the sense that when there is caloric restriction, for instance, AMPK is activated, it increases autophagy, it decreases mTOR signaling. So it has some similar effects to what we were just talking about, especially with some of the CERT1 and 2. And resveratrol has also been found to activate one of the sirtuins, and that sirtuin is CERT1. So this is the reason why you can see individuals supplementing with resveratrol, especially in combination with NMN. All the sirtuins need NMN, or NAD+, more specifically, and resveratrol is a known activator of CERT1. Resveratrol also has actions on mitochondria, so it seems to increase mitochondria activity as well. If you found this lesson helpful and informative, please let me know, and we can talk more about sirtuins in more detail in a future lesson. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Please consider joining as a member for members-only content. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.